first one reminds us that in this dark and troubled world, there is hope to be found in Jesus Christ. The second candle is the candle of love. God showed his great love toward us by sending his son, Jesus, into the world to be our savior. Mary showed her love for Jesus by caring for him tenderly, even though her circumstances were difficult. We can show our love for Jesus by reaching out to others during this Advent season and telling them about him. Amen. Well, in our God, we are so grateful that we can share so many concerns. Father, lots in our church family are struggling. Um, Father, lots are dealing with health issues and treatment plans and the unknown of not knowing what's to come. Father, we just pray that you would surround them with your, your presence, that they'd know your love and your grace and your peace while they wait that you may know your strength while they recover. Father, we, we, we pray for your healing hand. We pray for your will. That, Father, you would do those things that only a good, kind, and loving God can do in the midst of our struggles. Help us as church family to rally around and to encourage and send text, emails, porch visits, offer to help out, bring a meal, do whatever we can, Father, to help those that are part of our church family that are going through tough times. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the privilege we have to gather and worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about love today, and we're going to talk about a love story in the Bible. Um, at this time of the year, I, I, I won't ask you to raise your hands because some people will hold a judgment against you if you were to raise your hand with the question that I would ask. So sit on your hand so you don't instinctively raise it after I ask the question. If I were to ask how many of you love and watch Hallmark movies, <laughs> see some hands had to go up because you're such fans you can't help it. You can't wait till Christmas when the Hallmark movies come on. I... <laughs> I have to confess that I have made fun of people watching Hallmark movies and those of that genre. 
And there was a little meme that came out, and I should have had it, caught it and put it on the screen because I'll get it wrong. But it said something like, only Hallmark can make 482 movies with seven actors, one storyline, <laughs> and the same sets. And it's so true. Right? The storyline in their love stories, it's always the same. They happen to see each other. And the sparks kind of go. And then they kind of flirt and get closer. But then there's always something that causes a separation or a break. And you get hopeless like, oh no, she's leaving. Or oh no, he found another. Or sometimes they throw in that evil ex. Every now and then they run on two tracks where they each have an ex show up at the same time and there's this trauma of do I go with him or do I go with him and 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 then something right at the last minute in the last two and a half minutes of the movie the music changes they change the the, the their direction they turn and run back and fall into each other's arms. Every now and then they show a little blurb and show them two years later with married and kids and all that stuff, right? It, that's, the, that's the timeline. The location changes, although a lot of them are done at little mountain chalet kind of little quaint little towns in the snow in Can yeah, Canada. and um, The snow always starts falling at the, just the appropriate time, Right? <laughs> Right, as the, the music's building in your heart and you're tearing up and the snow starts falling. And that's what a love story is supposed to be, right? Okay, all of us are hopeless romantics in a little bit, I guess. And I had to quit picking on them because somebody in my family who I never thought would start watching those started watching them. And so I'll watch them too, and you know why? Not, I don't really get tearful at them much. But I like that they end well. They end happy. They end with the people who love each other getting together. And in our crazy world, sometimes it's fun to just like, somebody recommended another series. I love how people put up on Facebook, you know, oh, what's, what's good to watch on Netflix? And all of it starts with this series, this series, this series. Well, then I go and I read, I said, oh, I'll watch that one. And I read the thing, suspenseful dark, and something else. And I thought, do I really want to watch dark? It's Advent. So I went to, you know, Prime has their own kind of version of the Hallmark Channel. It's like, there must be 10,000 of these movies out there. It's not just Hallmark. And they all follow the same line. We talked about, I shared a storyline from one while I was trying not to electrocute myself wiring my barn. Uh, yesterday I got one playing down there at the bottom and it had a preacher in it and that's why it caught my eye. And the love story was this widowed preacher and this, this anyway, it was the, you don't need to know the whole story. You can, if I knew the title, I'd tell you go watch it this afternoon, but I don't know what it was. So, Advent is this time when we prepare to celebrate the coming of our Lord. And today we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about a love story. And as is going to be our pattern through Advent, though, you're going to hear a chapter of Philippians before I start the sermon. It's on love. And love is mentioned a couple times in here. This is not the sermon. Remember, this is Paul's words to the Philippian church. And a lot of it you can take as Kevin's words to Salem. Okay? Uh, we're actually in chapter 2 today. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? I certainly hope so. Any comfort from His love? Absolutely. Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Only the sweetest kind. Are your hearts tender and sympathetic? They should be. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one heart and purpose. I think I'll read that verse again. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one heart and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Oh, teenagers, listen to that. You don't need to please anybody but Jesus. Adults, you should listen too. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they're doing. You know how you know if you're doing this? 
Next time you strike up a conversation with somebody, pay attention to whether you talk more or ask more questions and listen. Hello? Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Pregnant pause to let that soak in. Your, my attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. And now he goes on to explain. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, after he'd already made himself a slave and and humbled himself, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on a cross. Because of this, God raised him up to the heights of heaven, gave him a name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the church said, Amen. Dearest friends, You were always so careful to follow my instructions when I was with you. Now that I'm away, you must be even more careful to put into action God's saving work in your lives. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey Him and the power to do what pleases Him. Believe it. Kevin's edition. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing. And the church said, Amen. So that no one can speak a word of blame against you. You are to live clean and innocent lives as children of God in a dark world full of crooked and perverse people. Man, is he writing to us. Let your lives shine brightly before them. Hold tightly to the word of life so that when Christ returns, I'll be proud that I did not lose the race and that my work was not useless. But even if my life is to be poured out like a drink offering to complete the sacrifice of your faithful service, that is, if I'm to die for you, I will rejoice. And I want to share my joy with all of you. And you should be happy about this and rejoice with me. If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon. Then he comes back, he can cheer me up by telling you how how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who generally cares about your welfare. All others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus. But you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He's helped me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what's going to happen to me here. I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus to you, back to you. He's a true brother, a faithful worker, a courageous soldier, and he has your message to help me in my need. Now I'm sending him home again, for he has been longing to see you, and he was very distressed, and he heard when, that you heard he was ill. He surely was ill. In fact, he almost died, but God had mercy on him and also on me that I would not have to bear an unbearable sorrow. So I'm in the more... So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know he'll be glad to see him, and he will lighten my cares. Welcome him with Christian love, with great joy. Be sure to honor people like him, for he risked his life for the work of Christ. He was at the point of death while trying to do for me the things you couldn't do because you were far away. The love of Christ changes everything. The love of Christ is at the core of our entire being for those of us who are believers, y'all. The only way to do any of the instructions Paul laid out is if we understand the love that God has for us. We can't think he loves us. We can't be sort of sure he loves us. We have to be convinced that he loves us. It has to be a settled part of our soul. So today, let's look at Mary and Joseph's story for just a little bit as kind of a love story. It makes a wonderful Hallmark movie. It has all the wrappings on it, doesn't it? 
I mean, these two young kids, a carpenter by trade, a, a, a down-to-earth, and he probably had to be a pretty good-looking guy, too. He had to be in shape. They didn't have any lifts and hydraulics back then, so he carried the wood around. They didn't have any power tools, so he used hand saws and chisels and hammers. So he was probably pretty in shape. And since he was kind of an in shape kind of bachelor guy for Mary to catch his eye, and you think, oh, Kevin, it's just an arranged marriage. God made it all happen. Well, it could be, but can't you put a little hallmark to it? Could it be that they fell in love too? Because the way they kind of walked through the struggles that they went through, I think they were in love and not just forced together like was the Jewish tradition where there was a contract made and a price paid and the time spent. You're married, it's a done deal, the contract's done, and you're married, but you haven't had any kind of ceremony and party like we do yet. So the two, I think, had some love in their hearts. They certainly had love in their hearts for God, and I don't think God would choose to make the people who he chose for such an important task miserable by putting them together, would he? I don't think so. Would he want Jesus to be raised in one of those homes? Well, God made me do this. I don't know why i got to put up with you, woman. I don't think so. I think God wanted Jesus in a home that was filled with love and mutual appreciation and respect and caring, honesty, right? I think so. So we know the story very well. <coughs> Mary <coughs> is minding her own business, and the Holy Spirit comes upon her. And somehow, miraculously, the immaculate conception occurs. And Mary's with child, the Son of God, engaged to Joe. Joe, being like any man I know, <laughs> hears this news, and it went a, probably better than it would go with most men I know. But he was mad. He didn't know what to do. We don't get the whole story. Did he yell at Mary? Did he storm out of the room? Did he say I, in tears, I can't believe you did this to me? I don't know. But we know that God sent him a special visitor too. Isn't it interesting how what it, Mary finds out about this, it's a mess, she goes to see her cousin, right? And remember the baby within her cousin leaps for joy and she greets her with blessed are you among women, all that, right? Just what Mary needed as it's fallen apart with Joe and she doesn't know what's going to happen, she gets there and it's like, that's what God said, how do you know? How'd your baby know? He must be right. And God gave her what she needed. Joseph gets a visit in the night. Joseph, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. The child she carrying really is mine. Oh, and by the way, I picked you to be the earthly father of my son. Don't you mess it up. Sorry, a little addition there from Kevin, just how I think it would have gone. And whether the angel said that or not, don't you think he felt it? Can you imagine, men, to be the fill-in surrogate father of the Son of God helping God out on this planet? You want a humbling experience. Every time you want to say, Jesus, don't you talk to your mother like that. If Jesus ever talked to Mary like that, which I don't know if he did, but if he was 100% human, he had to, right? He had to be a regular kid, a regular two-year-old that's into everything. Right? Because he was 100% human and divine. And I don't know how that all played out. But I cannot imagine what it must be like to have been Joseph. To have been entrusted with the human rearing, caring for, protecting, raising of the Son of God. And God not only watching your every movement, but knowing your every thought. I think of it on the dad's side. I'm not taking anything away from Mary. I can't even imagine that either. 
I don't, she had to wonder, how in the world did this happen inside of me? And then she had to go, why in the world did this happen, right? <laughs> Two remarkable young people who endured all the mess that goes with this story that makes no sense to every, anybody who didn't have those visits. But we need to take away that God provided what each of them needed while they were faithfully carrying out the task that God had for them. Right? He does that for us too. I can't imagine how they tried to figure out this whole, how are we going to do this raising him thing? And then there's the whole, we got to get up and we got to go. And they make the long trip. And they weren't in a luxury SUV with air conditioning, air suspension, and cushioned seats. It was a miserable journey. And they come into town and there's no room for them at the inn, as we just said. There was no place for them to go. The town was overrun with people. And nobody in that town really cared about them. Our, our kids' church is having their children gather this afternoon, and they're going to watch the star. Uh, if you haven't watched the star with the donkey in it, you really ought to watch the star. It is one of the greatest animated films of Jesus' birth and it's got so much humor for, a parent, for parents to enjoy while the kids love the animation. It's wonderful. And in it, you got all the animals that are just loving life. But for everybody else around town, they were just in the way. And they had nobody but each other. And they clung to one another, and they prayed for God's help. And we know the story. She gave birth. And she gave birth to Jesus. Now, to me, that's a love story that withstands most any test. They went through great upheaval and turmoil. They didn't have that threat of leaving except early on. I guess they did early on, but then the whole story took place after that instead of that being the climax of the story. Because the real story isn't their love, right? It's the love that God has for us that is shown in that little baby that was born. And that's the part we're going to wrap up with. 1 John 4.16 says, We've come to know and believe that the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his only Son. He gave his only son. He gave his only son for you and for me. Jesus took your place and my place. I don't know about how long your sin list is about now, but I bet you if all of us were honest and we wrote down every sin that just happened this morning in our minds, our hearts, or our actions, and we kind of passed the piece of paper around and just had everybody add to the list with theirs, do you think we'd have a long list or a short list? This is Sunday, y'all. It should be short. <laughs> right? But it'd probably be long. We could probably have a long list if we just talked about the sins you thought of or did since you got to church. And Jesus, Jesus pays the penalty for all of those so that God can enjoy our wonderful presence in heaven no, because he loves us so much. Because his love for us is that great. His love for us is that big, that full, that all-encompassing. Not a one of us in this room deserves the time of day from God. We don't deserve the gift of life in the first place. See, God's gift to us could have been that he gives us life and gives us the chance to live a life holy enough to make it above the threshold and get into heaven right? The gift of life would have been enough. He gave us the gift of life, and some of us had it easier than others, and some of us had physical challenges or financial challenges or parental or relational challenges, but we still have the gift of life. And then he gave us this incredible thing called the Holy Spirit to live with us and dwell with us and lead us and guide us and comfort us and strengthen us and correct us 
and be with us, present with us, nonstop, 24-7, every day we're alive on this planet. So that when we die, His gift of life eternal becomes ours forever. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This Christmas season, this Advent season, when we think about love, I, 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 I hope it overwhelms you. It, it, it should make you speechless. It's wonderful that we know John 3.16 3, and we can all spout it off in a couple of different translations. Yay. Go team. But that familiarity means it's hard to make it special. Is this the first time any of y'all have seen a nativity scene? Is this the first time you've ever sat through an Advent sermon on love? Is it the first time you've ever sung the carols we just sang? We know it all so well. And with that familiarity, my fear is that we kind of take it all for granted. The Christmas story is not a Hallmark movie. The Christmas story is not a literary masterpiece. The Christmas story is the account of God the Father loving His creation enough that He sent His Son into our mess. A dung-filled stable. If there were animals around, they stunk, right? The donkey she rode had not gotten detailed at the donkey shop before they left for the trip. Holy, perfect, all-knowing, almighty Son of God comes into our world and our mess. And I love what one commentator that I read this week said, so that God can more fully understand what it's like to be us. You ever think about it that way? That's how God the Father has never lived as a human being except through the Son. To understand what life is like for us. So we can't just say to God, you don't understand, like some children do to their parents. I love it how our kids or grandkids forget that we were them too. You know, we all had to live through it. God lived through it through Jesus because of his great love for you and for me. And it is that love that changes and transforms everything. Everything. If that's not your reality, can I ask you to spend some time this week thinking about the love of God? If, if, if that's not what, what you experience when you sit down and think about God, when you read the Christmas story, do you buzz through it in your devotional? Because, well, I've read that every year for like forever. There's nothing new there. There's nothing that's going to grab my attention. Oh, be careful, little child, what you say. Because if you slow down, my hunch is the Holy Spirit's going to go, bing! And it's going to be like a word, a phrase, a part of the story is going to just jump out and it's going to relate to right where you're struggling in your life right now. And the scripture is going to come alive yet again because of God's great love for you. That's my prayer for us this Advent season. That we dig in, we slow down, and we allow the reality of his love to change our lives and our hearts in our Christmas celebrations. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the love you have for us. We thank you for a, a love story in the Bible that we often just don't read from that perspective. But Father, we thank you most of all for your love. It is the love story of the ages. It will never be topped. It will never be fully understood. But Father, it is what gives us hope it's what gives us life. It's what transforms our lives. It's what gives us reason and purpose as we try to share that love with other people. It's what gives us the stuff to be able to live out Paul's encouragements to the Philippians. It shows us how to love our spouses, our children, our friends, our church family, our neighborhood, our community. 
God, help us to understand your love more and more each day. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you all for being able to stay. It's always an important time in the life of our church when we get to, to participate in the ordination of uh, those that are willing to say, yes, I'll serve the church. And I feel that God has, has called me and, and allowed me to, to take this opportunity to serve in a unique way um, a, as a deacon. Uh, if you don't know and you're newer to the church, our deacons serve for, for three years unless it's COVID. Right, Randy Thomas? Um, you know, COVID messed up a little scheduling, but that's okay. Um, it, it is, uh, it's typically a three-year term um, and, and then rotate off, and many of our guys serve many terms, but they just don't go back to back. Um, the deacon is a servant uh, of the church. Uh, the biblical precedent gets set in the taking care of the widows and, uh, and those that had a, a, a need um, so that the, the, the elder, the pastor in our way of doing things, um, could focus on the word and prayer, the scriptures say. And uh, so our guys serve the church, try to, to keep up with the families in the church, and um, help us do ministry in, through this church family. So uh, Ken Searles uh, and Ray Massey aren't... Uh, Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must first be tested, and if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Would you join me in our litany? <clears throat> Today we set apart for ministry these men whom you've chosen to be your servants. What would you like to say to them?